La spera è alta in sabati, quello che è uscito in prima sabati, veni in Maria Magdalene, l'altra Maria vivere se poco. E le cetere molto sbatto se smagno. Angelo sera un domini descendi del cielo, e la cenne trevobi lapidem, e se le va supereo. Era rata me aspectu se o sigur fulgur, e vestim mendu me o sigur ni. Prete more ata me o sexteritis sunt custodes, 
the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. After the Midnight Mass, you all are welcome for refreshments down in the refectory of the seminary. And we congratulate today on this uh, beautiful <clears throat> night of the resurrection. It is now past midnight, and Mother Church has us up bright and early to greet and salute Jesus Christ the King, our Lord Jesus Christ the King who is true God, who is true priest, who is the true and only Savior. There is no other name under heaven whereby any of us can go to heaven. We cannot be saved through Buddha. You cannot be saved through Muhammad and the false god Allah. Allah. You cannot go to heaven through Judaism. They refuse Jesus Christ. You cannot go to heaven through Martin Luther and John Calvin and Huss and Joseph Smith all their twisting and omissions of our Lord's teachings. We can only go to heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only Son of the Father. There is not five, there's not fifty. There's only one divine Son. And this divine Son, the Father loves, was an infinite love. The love that human words cannot even possibly come close to expressing. So great is the love between the Father and the Son that it has the eternal procession of the third person without a beginning of time, the eternal procession of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> and God has made us, in the book of Genesis, it does not say, let me make God in my image. Excuse me. Let me make man in my image. It doesn't say that. Let me make man in my image. What does it say in the book of Genesis? Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the plural, let us make man in our image. And God created in six days the creation, and man on the sixth day, Friday. And man, of course, in our first parents, Turned from God, deceived by the devil, they ate the apple, they betrayed God, and plunged the, the whole human race into death, sickness, disease, wars, women giving birth to children with pain and suffering, men having to support their families and their dear wives uh, with the work and sweat of the labor of their hands and of their brow, and our gardens grow full of weeds. And we have many sorrows and tears in this life. And the gates of heaven were shut. There was no way to go to heaven. Locked out from the joys of eternal paradise. And since sin was in us, and since we are so 
overtaken by the original sin and the effects of sin, very few would even go to the limbo of the fathers. So our Lord Jesus Christ told the Eternal Father, Eche ad sum, behold, I will come, and I will lay down my life for them, and I will be the sacrificial lamb for them, and I will lead them on, like the true Moses across the Red Sea on dry land, and crush the power of the devil in hell from their soul by washing away original sin with my blood. And I will be the new uh, Noah who will build the new ark of the Catholic Church outside of which everyone drowns. And if they come through this door of the side of the ark, that is the door of the heart of Jesus opened on the cross, and they wash in my precious blood, then they will be washed and made worthy with the state of grace to go to heaven. And so God has invented what love could never even have dreamt of. Not even the pagans, says St. Thomas, not even the pagans even imagined a God that would take on flesh and be brutally crucified and mocked by us. The very men, us, sitting in these pews, we were there with those scourgers and the executioners. We were there with them spitting on our Lord. So was I. We were there scourging him. We were there crowning him with thorns. We were there mocking him. We were there ashamed of him. But we're ashamed to proclaim him, to make the sign of the cross in public. When we're ashamed to wear our scapular. When we're ashamed to know, to let others know that we are Catholic, we are children of God, we belong to the church militant. We were ashamed of Christ on that first Good Friday. <clears throat> and what does our Lord say? Who is ashamed of me before men? I will not know before my Father. I will be ashamed of them before my Father. So our Lord Jesus Christ crucified. He died on the cross. This is the reality. This was the redemption. And we are Catholic. We love this reality that our God has so loved us that he died on the cross. We're not ashamed to put him on the cross and adore him. And in the Mass, to get on our knees and adore the same sacrifice of Calvary. That is Catholicism. I preach Jesus Christ, says St. Paul, and not Jesus Christ somewhere with a cross without Christ. Not Jesus Christ <clears throat> redeeming us only by the resurrection, because the resurrection doesn't make sense unless he died brutally on the cross. And the cross is Jesus Christ crucified. I preach Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified, says St. Paul. And so for us to go to rise with Christ in the resurrection, to rise from the chain of our sins, we must follow the path of the cross. We must profess the Holy Catholic faith completely, integrally, with no poison of Vatican II in the new Mass. We must totally reject this poison. That's why we're here. That's why we have a seminary here. Because we want to be faithful to the popes of tradition. We want to be faithful to our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre. And we are ashamed, we are saddened at our brothers in the Society of St. Pius X and our superiors as well who have turned from the path of Archbishop Lefebvre, who want to seek to come under these modernists, who have destroyed the faith of millions of Catholics throughout the world and are taking them by truckloads to hell and want to, want to make peace with these enemies and destroyers of the faith. While Archbishop Lefebvre warned us, do not make peace. Do not put yourself under obedience to these modernists until the Pope, until Rome comes back to tradition. And so we hold fast to the faith. We profess the Catholic faith of all time. And we want to live this faith as well. This is the hard part. And for me, too, it's easy to get up here and preach. <clears throat> Not always. But it's easy to the priest to bark from the pulpits. We're supposed to. But we also have to live this holy faith. We have to strive to live the, what we profess. And the first commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now those candles you're holding, they look alive, don't they? They give off light. They give off warmth. <laughs> And if you blow it out, it's black, cold, stiff. A soul in mortal sin is black. There's no fire, there's no life, there's, it's gutless, it's, 
It's ready to be thrown into the eternal flames. But our Lord is loved and he's good and he's merciful and he's patient. Thank God he's patient. And he gives us a whole, however long he gives us in our lifetime. Some only live five years, some 16 years, some 30, some 40, 50, 100, 120. And even if you live 130 years, that's long, but it's not that long compared to eternity. And Adam and Eve lived 930 years doing penance, and they're in heaven, they're saints. <clears throat> but that was still short compared to eternity. And what matters is to live in the state of grace. That's why Christ said himself, I have come to cast fire on the earth. And what do I will but that this fire be enkindled in your souls? And just like that candle, there's warmth, there's light. It almost has a life of its own, doesn't it? Well, when, when you live in the state of grace, the Holy Trinity dwells in your soul. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They really are there. And they want to find in your soul a home to be loved, to be thought of, to be conversed with, to be befriended. And this is one of the signs of the state of grace. Some people always wonder, how do I know if I'm in the state of grace? What's the signs of it? And St. Robert Bellarmine says, and also St. Thomas Aquinas says, that you find a certain enjoyment in God. You find an interest and joy in God. When two people are in love before marriage, they're, they're totally enthralled with each other. They call each other every minute of the day. They text each other a thousand times a day. They're always thinking about each other all day. And... <clears throat> When they have to be separated, their hearts are pulling to see each other again. And that's normal. God built us to love. We love our mom. We love our dad. We love our brothers and sisters. We love uh, the ones you're going to marry. And you, you love the ones you have married. And you old, gray-haired, married people, how beautifully seasoned is your love. Because you have learned to forgive each other. You've learned to love with a real love, which is for the love of God. That's the hard part in marriage. After the Hollywood scene stops and the, the, the cupids fly away and the stars stop flying around and the uh, honeymoon stops, <clears throat> then marriage and love really begin. And Christ teaches us that love is in blood. Love is in suffering for the one we love. And our Lord wants this with us. And love seeks like the flame to go upward. So our hearts and our minds must be always tending and thinking and ordering our life to God. We have to. This is the first commandment. And we live in an apostate age that tells, you, tells us, forget Jesus Christ the King. Forget Him. This is a democratic age. Jesus Christ is history. And the Bible's not true. And the faith is dead. And God is dead. And yet, in the public schools this past week, they had school open on Good Friday, to the shame of the United States allowing this. On the day Christ died, the public schools, public universities, opened a normal day, oh hum. What an insult to the true God. And this draws down, certainly, the anger of God. When men live like God doesn't exist. And that is what separation of church has done to our heads, people. It has twisted our minds. It has sickened our hearts that we have become apostate-minded. We have, we, have we have learned to live happy without Jesus Christ in our public domain, in our economics, in our social life. We have conveniently put Jesus Christ in a nice corner in the chapel. But when he dwells in the tabernacle, that fire is meant to spread for the, and convert the whole world. And so that fire you hold in your hands, we must live in the state of grace. We must tend to go upwards like that flame, always tending to go to the glory of God and raising our thoughts to God and our hearts to God every day. St. Alphonsus says it's a mortal sin to go a whole month without prayer. A whole month. And we must love God. And when you love someone, you don't, you don't want to not think of them for a month. You think of them every time, every day, very often. And love tends to, to unite the person you enjoy. So we must come to enjoy God. And how do you do that? 
And not in the silly, frivolous, Protestant sense, and novus ordo sense, of hand clapping and foolish hallelujahs with uh, <laughs> foolish campfire hymns sung at the altar. That insults God. That is not pleasing to God. But what pleases God is a humble and contrite heart. That's our place before our Lord. The three kings teach us to adore him. That's what presidents should be doing. That's what our Supreme Court should be doing. Adoring Jesus Christ as God and King. And because they don't, we will get the punishment that comes from ignoring him and rejecting him. And as a nation. <clears throat> but at least you, my friends, says our Lord, at least you, friends, and those of you consecrated to the Virgin Mary, ask her to inflame you with the love of God. Ask her to inflame you. And you know, there was one day on this earth when there was no more light at all. It was all darkness. No faith at all. Christ died on the cross. And in that hurricane and in the earthquake and the darkness for three hours, there was only one flickering candle that stayed lit at the foot of the cross. Who was that? The Blessed Virgin Mary. She alone kept the fire of the love of God and the fire of the Catholic faith. So in this hurricane of the church history now, when the Pope of Rome is foolish and betraying our Lord and scandalizing the whole world with his, his, his heretical comments and his insulting comments to our Lord Jesus Christ, and to morals. It's a shame, the, the, these popes of modernism. They have really betrayed our Lord like Peter did the first night of, of Good Friday. And St. Peter teaches us that we can have popes that are very human, that are very prone to sin, and even betray our Lord. And they're still popes. That's why we pray for Pope Francis. We're ashamed of him. We pray for his conversion. <coughs> But we, what can we do? We have to hold the light of faith in this hurricane. And your candles will blow out. You will lose the faith. You will not keep your, the, the, the state of grace and save your soul without the shield of the Virgin Mary. Unless you get under her mantle, you're gone. Me too. We are goners. So the Virgin Mary, she, she never lost the faith. She always believed that our Lord would stay true to his words, that he would rise from the dead. And on this morning of the first day of the resurrection, the first Easter morning, Christ the King rose from the dead. <clears throat> Death could not hold him down. And St. Gregory says, when they were mocking him at the cross, Come down, you fool, from the cross. You say you're Elias? You say you're the Son of God, come down and we'll believe you. As they mocked and spat on him and threw rocks at him and insulted the Mother of God. And St. Saint Saint Gregory the Great says, All right, let's just say if our Lord did come from, down from the cross. Which is more stunning? Which is more convincing? Which is more impossible? That a man alive come down from the cross? Or that a man dying on the cross, rigor mortis setting in, and the shroud shows the rigor mortis already set in on the cross. He was as stiff as a board. He couldn't bend his arms, but the shroud shows his arms straight. And his arms are straight because his arms are open to love and embrace all souls and bring them to his heart. That's the fact. That's the love of God. And what is more impressive, a, a live man coming down alive from the cross or a dead man buried after th three days rising from the dead. And that's what happened. Christ chose the more impossible thing, and he did it. And he conquered death, and death cannot hold him down anymore. And death, physical death, will hold us down. We're all going to have our cemetery, we're going to all have our burial, we're all going to have, hopefully, our funeral mass. Hopefully we'll have people praying for us. Hopefully we'll have priests saying the Mass for us. We're all going to be buried six foot under. But that's just a physical death. And that's just a passage to heaven. If your soul's in the state of grace, you don't die. 
You go to purgatory if we have to be purified. And that's why Christ became man. That's why he came down to set this fire ablaze on the earth. So that we would be enkindled with his divine love. That his fire would burn in us by the love of God, the state of grace. And that's the treasure that we must hold fast to. And love our Lord with all our heart, all our strength, all our mind. And it's hard work, isn't it? It's hard work. You families know it's hard to pray the rosary now. There's so much going on, so many distractions. How do you get the family to get together to pray the rosary? You got to do it. But what a blessing when a family does. What a blessing. Heaven sends down tons of graces. And even if all you do is fight distractions all the rosary time, you're fighting for our Lord. That's good. Just keep fighting. And honor our Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight is the great night of the resurrection of Christ. And this whole time of the resurrection, this whole week, is a first class feast. And Jesus Christ conquers. Jesus Christ rules. Jesus Christ commands. And when Jesus Christ, who dwells very soon on this altar in the sacrifice, he comes down, that fire from heaven comes down at the consecration of the altar and will feed you with his divine life, his divine body, blood, soul, and divinity. And today we have two first communions. The young lady that was baptized, she's going to receive communion, Sydney, Renee, <clears throat> and little uh, Madeline, nicknamed May May. <laughs> little May May will receive her first communion. She's got a little fever now, and she told her mom and dad, no, I don't want to go to bed. I want to be here to receive our Lord. So this little girl, this shy little girl, if you say May May to her, she hides under the table, but she's as sweet as candy. And she teaches us, She's got a fever right now, and she's making her first communion. And how many of us would, you know, oh, I can't go to Mass. But when it comes to football games, when it comes to basketball games, people fill the stadium, sick or not, they're there. And there's many accounts of below zero weather, and the stadia are filled to watch a game. Below zero weather, little snow on the roads, oh, I can't go to Mass little sick, but I can't pray the rosary. Too busy to study my catechism. Too busy to give time to Christ. Remember this, folks, and this applies to me. We don't give much time to God. He won't give much time to us. He's died for us. He loves us. He knocks at our door. But if we treat him cold, he's not going to come forcing himself on us. He respects us incredibly much. He would love to grab us by the neck and throttle us, but for most people, they don't want it. So our Lord, He doesn't handcuff you and I, but He handcuffs Himself to the cross. He doesn't scourge you and I who deserve it for our sins, but He gets torn to bits and crowned with thorns and dies for the love of us. That's the only way he can force us to love him. So love him in return. And love him with all your hearts, with all your minds. Run after him. This is a race. This is a war. And the devil knows it. He, he's angry. He's like a tearing, rabid lion seeking to stop you all from keeping the faith, keeping the state of grace, and obtaining what he lost. So dear faithful, Christ conquers. Christ rules. Christ commands. This is our God, and he will be, on the day of judgment, the whole human race will see him. And Obama will be peeing his pants and on his knees before Jesus Christ the King. And so will Muhammad be on his knees before Jesus Christ the King. So will Joseph Smith, so will all the Jews, the Judeo-Masons, who are working to eliminate Christ from the face of the earth and doing it very successfully as cowardly Catholics sit back on their couches and let it happen. And as modernism destroys and infects our Catholic Church, the spineless bishops, the, the saltless priests who have lost their flavor, 
and our poor church falling, imploding. And Jesus Christ will judge all these modernists who said the Bible's not true, Adam and Eve is a myth, Jonah and the whale is a myth, the resurrection is just a fable. Uh, well, they're in for a big surprise when Christ comes and his wounds are shining and he's holding the cross. This is Jesus Christ, the King, who will judge all the Senate, all the Supreme Court, all the ones who passed the abortion law in 1973. Most, some of them have already gone to their judgment. And our land with drips with blood of abortions. What a nightmare. That cries to heaven for vengeance. So, dear faithful, in an age where men's hearts have grown frozen cold, and prefer the drinking from the mud puddles of this world and all its vanities and, and lustful pleasures. Let us at least go to the, our Lord says, come to me and drink. I'm not going to poison you with muddy water. I'll give you the true fountain of life to drink, which is his precious blood, his divine <coughs> grace, his refreshing waters. But we've got to make some sacrifices to drink that water. We've got to make time to pray. We've got to make time to spiritual reading. We've got to make time for spiritual study. We've got to really practice the virtues of patience, humility, forgiving one another in a family or between spouses. We've got to really <coughs> look at it. It's tough work. And all of you, you're with the resistance. You're with the St. Sinai, St. Sinai, St. Pius X, Mary and Cor. And you know already what a fight it is. I'm not telling you anything new. But let me encourage you to keep fighting. God wants us to fight in this time. And when those soldiers, fighting men, when those soldiers felt the earthquake on the morning of this, the first resurrection, and they saw that huge stone rock roll over, and the seals that were cemented and pounded in with nails around the entrance, blocking it, broken, and the whole earth shaking, and, the, and a light emitting, <clears throat> a blinding light emitting from the tomb, that where Christ rose from the dead like a flash of lightning. The women going there <clears throat> saw this, St. Mary Magdalene saw it, and they, she said those soldiers, and it could have been up to a hundred of them, maybe fifty of them, but these are tough Roman soldiers. They've been in battle, they've been marching, they know what night vigils are about. They were dead scared. Velut mortui, says St. John. They were as if dead. They were so scared. And then they ran to the Jews and said, Pay us the money. We know that his body was not stolen by his apostles. We witnessed it ourselves. And what did the Jews say? Look, we'll give you more money and tell everybody that the apostles came and stole the body. And they said, no, this is a lie. We were there to see it. There were no apostles around. And where were the apostles, everybody? They were like little mice hiding in the bushes. They were too scared. They would be scared all the way to Pentecost, afraid to be the next ones crucified. So even the Roman soldiers, and we have some Roman soldiers that were canonized saints and martyrs. And St. Longinus was one of them. He witnessed, the res he witnessed the death of Christ. He punctured open his heart. And maybe he was one of those soldiers also assigned at <clears throat> the tomb as well. And St. Longinus professed the Catholic faith as a soldier, and he died a martyr for the Catholic faith. So, dear faithful, you're all soldiers by our confirmation. And on this joyful day of the Holy Resurrection, make this our first communion. Receive our Lord like, like it was our first time meeting Him and receiving Him in communion. And join your first communion with little May May and uh, Sydney, who have the happiness to receive our Lord now very soon. And this Mass is quite short, so um, <clears throat> Father, you've gone long enough. I know, I'm going to put you to sleep. But Happy Easter to all of you. Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus imperat. Christ conquers, Christ rules, Christ commands. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.